All right, good morning all. We're here for the Family Law A docket. Judge Evans, uh, Commissioner Carmody is going to be hearing the first matter on the docket, which is Couch v. Couch. And then once she's completed with that, then I'll, I'll resume. So let me just check in with the parties first. I'll let you know what I have. Um, I have reviewed this file. I know that this case has been going on for quite some time. I have taken a look um, back historically at what has happened in this case, different orders that have been entered. Um, we're here today based on my understanding, and parties, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, a motion for contempt that was filed by Ms. Ward on behalf of Ms. Couch and a uh, separate motion to sell business property also filed by Ms. Ward on behalf of Ms. Couch. Is that the party's understanding as to why we're here today? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And I did receive the bench copies that you had originally uh, forwarded to Judge Evans. Um, I did receive those yesterday. Mr. Couch, is that also your understanding? Yes. Okay. Have you received copies of these documents, the motion for contempt and the motion to sell business property? Yes. Okay. Ms. Ward, since these are your motions, I'll let you go first with any argument you want to make to the court and um, address these requests in whatever order you wish. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I, I know that you're familiar with the file. It sounds like you've looked back at the orders, and I don't want to take up too much time on the docket. So I'll just briefly summarize our request. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, the motion for contempt is pretty straightforward. Uh, as Your Honor is aware, uh, there is an order in place requiring uh, combined family support in the amount of $5,000 per month. Uh, that has not been paid since we were last before the court. I made sure that the dates uh, included are outside of any previous orders that have addressed this um, and the amounts owed, I don't think that that's going to be disputed. Um, likewise, the child's tuition, again, this isn't an order that that needs to be paid. That was previously agreed by the parties. Um, that has not been paid in quite some time. And that's a pretty pressing issue because the child is uh, on the cusp of just being kicked out of the school because her tuition is not being paid. And then, of course, because my client isn't receiving any family support, uh, that just makes her uh, even more challenged in terms of making sure that that gets paid. So far, she's been trying to work with the school to get extensions for the child, but the, the school seems to be losing patience on that front. Uh, as far as the outstanding personal and business expenses, Mr. Couch has been ordered uh, both to file them and to pay them. When we've previously been before the court, uh, he's been given extensions on two separate occasions to get that done. That still hasn't been done. Uh, my concern is that we are really trying to wrap this case up. We have uh, appeared at two different settlement conferences in an attempt to narrow the issues and get things resolved. That isn't going anywhere. So at this point, we're awaiting a trial date, but I want to be sure that I have all of the information in terms of debts owed uh, before we move forward with that. And again, there have been two motions to compel. Um, we also did a CR2A with Commissioner Nelson to try to get information regarding the debts. I don't have the information that I need. And so that's just something that is concerning to me. Um, let's see here. Uh, with regard to the business property, um, Mr. Couch was ordered to make all minimum payments on all debts. Um, so the debts that had arisen with regard to non-payment for the business property were his responsibility. He has not made any of those payment. Well, he's he, I believe at one point he paid some back uh, property taxes owed, but there were still many other debts that went unpaid to the point that the uh, property is now actively in foreclosure. Um, we have asked whether he would voluntarily agree to list the business property for sale, given that it's in foreclosure. I think there is a fundamental misunderstanding between myself and Mr. Couch. Uh, he seems to think that my client and uh, seems to be sharing with the children that my client is is the one who's uh, basically pushing for the business property to be sold. But I, I believe Your Honor received also the notice of trustee sale, which was received most recently. And there is a sale of the property scheduled for November 3rd, 2023. So the, the property is going to be sold. We're not here to decide whether or not it's going to be sold. It's a question of whether we can <laughs> do it at a private sale and hopefully recoup more funds for the, the parties to pay off debts, to hopefully have a little bit of equity left over. But regardless, we're going to get more equity out of a private sale than we are out of a bargain basement trustee sure. sale. So that's really um, why we're asking to get this sold as soon yeah, as possible. Um, I, I feel like someone is talking. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, 
in in some uh that's that's why we're here uh we'd really like to uh get this business property listed as soon as possible um because if we don't and especially right now since it's the summer uh i think we have the best chance if we get it listed right now to hopefully avoid just uh um having it auctioned off in november okay i do have some questions thank you miss ward i do have some questions for you on the request to um have this court sign an order to sell the business property. But first, let me do this. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Couch to address the contempt allegations and kind of deal with that separately. And then I'm going to come back to you on the business property, if that's okay. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Mr. Couch, um, so you have received the motion um, for contempt. Um, what is your response to that? I didn't see anything filed. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Um, for one, I don't have the money and I, I never have. And the um, petitioner somehow got her attorney to believe that I have these thousands and thousands of dollars. I never did. Uh, originally, it was erroneously put down on my financial back when we first, the first hearing we ever had in 2021, that I uh, netted some $12,000 like for one month, but I have a seasonal business and that's just how much money comes in over a three month period. And it does not reflect my annual income after all the expenses. It's drastically different than that. And so that's when uh, Judge Hahn looked at it and said, oh yeah, he can afford this. And I really couldn't then. And even now I'd had to borrow $38,000 from my son from the sale of his property just to settle the last contempt, but they still keep asking for this 5,000. I don't have money for an attorney even. I've, I've tried, you know, and it's just uh, now, oh, I tried to um, modify that, but since it's in temporary, I can't modify the child support or the the spousal support. So I'm in this catch 22. So it just keeps clicking along at $5,000 a month. I make $1,250 a month right now. I've had to move out of my house. The petitioner worked with the landlord there to have me essentially evicted. I live in an RV. I'm at, I live on the business property with my two sons and both of them and my daughter have their business, you know, enterprise here. This is this is our future. This is a family business. And the petitioner is just trying to kill it. There's more debts. The debts, I have $163,000 here. Uh, Miss Ward says, oh, he doesn't have any debts. When, if you look at all of the filings and pleadings from them or her side, says the reason that uh, the petitioner is divorcing me is because I have all these debts. But so she says, oh, he doesn't have any debts. And I do, but no one will like, listen to me. And when I get, for example, she sent me all of this stuff and this is how it comes when it's printed out. It And she says, uh, go and mark all this stuff. And it, it just comes out as this, you know, this is how it looks when it was sent to me. And then she tells the judge that I am not responding. And I, you know, and so anyway, I don't have a way to stop this. It's like, like a runaway train. And now they want to take the very, I won't have any place to live. Neither will my, my two sons. And my daughter already is staying, living with someone like they're nice enough to let her stay with them. And I think it's just very unjust. And it's kind of, I think it's more, um, uh, punishment and revenge rather than really numbers. So let me just um, go to the, the factual things. I, I hear what you have to say, Mr. Couch, and I appreciate your input. Um, just kind of looking at the objective things that I can measure, um, are both parties in agreement that the, the temporary order of January 18, 2022 is still the order that we're working off of, that that's the most I see that as the most recent order that the court has issued addressing things like family support. I believe so. 
Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So um, then taking that a step further, Mr. Couch, um, I did see there was a prior contempt order signed for family support up through April 8. And as Ms. Ward pointed out, this new uh, contempt request doesn't cover that same period. It starts April 8, 2022 and goes through June 2023. Mr. Couch, have you been able to make any partial payments towards family support for those months? I have not, okay. it, but that was 38000 that was paid. It, it should be like a, a fraction of that. In fact, I'm working with the um, child support folks, they, they know the situation, but they're, they said their hands are tied because it's in this temporary status. So the so 38,000 38, you're talking about, can the parties tell me what that was applied to, if anything? A well, that, that was basically what we're looking at here where it says contempt, these amounts, like it says, um, well, it just says 70 here, but it's like $5,000 a month from would it have been August or October, I think 2021 till the spring of 2022. Okay. There was that, there was, you know, penalties and lawyers fees. And, and it, it came out to 38,000 or, you know, I was okay, essentially going to jail. Contempt order. So the yeah. prior, so, so I had to, the, yeah. the, the 38,000 did uh, take care of the prior contempt order, correct? Yes, it did. Okay. And then Mr. Couch on the um, tuition for the minor child, mm -hmm. um, there's a statement in this motion for contempt that about six, a little over $6,000 is owing. Have you been able to pay anything on your, that amount? Your honor, the, that I, the petitioner was going to homeschool our daughter. And then at the 11th hour, she said, no, I'm going to put her in this school. I don't, I don't have a say to that. Right. I would, I can't understand why she can't go to public school, but she insists that she goes to a private school at the same time, claiming that, you know, it doesn't have any money. I, I don't have the money for that, but she goes ahead and puts her in the private school for about $600 a month. And then sends me the bill that I can't pay. It's it's ludicrous. Like I don't know how that. And then and then Miss Ward says, "Oh, he's in contempt for not paying six hundred dollars a month for his daughter." I'm I'm neglectful. It's that we have public schools for that, Your Honor. And I, Miss Ward, maybe you can help me. Which order contains the requirement that he pay tuition for private school? I think that should be in the standard uh, temporary order. Uh, let me just look here. Oh, there we go. It's in a paragraph under number five. Respondent is responsible for paying the child's tuition. It does contain a little caveat. It says comma as agreed by the parties. Oh, no, that that was to say it what the thing is, it was originally agreed by the parties. That's what that means. It was, it wasn't that the court had ordered it. It was by agreement at, of the parties at the time the temporary orders were entered that we were adding this to the order. I understand that um, Mr. Couch has clearly changed his mind at this point, but it was in the order per agreement of the parties when he was represented by counsel. Okay. Mr. Your Honor, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. And I just, right now, just focus on this issue of the okay. tuition and I am. what your it, understanding it's, is it's about that. Agreeing originally, uh, the petitioner said that she was going to homeschool. And then, like I said, at the 11th hour, she said, oh, I'm putting her into, into the school. Will you agree? Because she's getting a job. I agreed at that very point that this was temporary. This is like more or less an emergency to then, then get her into school and then figure it out. But the reality is I don't have the money for it. I, whether I even agreed to it or not, if I don't have the money, I don't have it. And so, but I don't have a say in it. Even to right now, she says, no, she, uh, that's not even a point of negotiation that she's going to go to private school. Even she knows I don't have the money, but, just, but so I don't understand that. I don't understand how I can be held to um, paying 
the tuition when I can't. On the contempt issue, unless Ms. Ward, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think Mr. Couch made it clear if that was the agreement of the parties. My client just wants to keep consistency for the child. Um, I don't really, I think your honor probably has everything that you need, but if any of those points need clarification, I'm happy to provide it. Um, here's my ruling on the contempt hearing um, and the request for the order taking into account what the parties have stated today. My review of the 2022 orders that I believe are still in effect today and have not been modified and my review of uh, prior contempt ruling, the um, prior contempt order of March 22, 2022 um, mirrors the monthly amounts that are contained in the January 18, 2022 temporary order. Um, the prior contempt order did also uh, include a finding of contempt for the past uh, unpaid tuition. Um, so although I think that Mr. Couch, I understand you today stating, you know, this is not an agreement that you still want to be involved with. It does appear to me based on prior judicial rulings that um, you did agree to pay for the uh, child's tuition. It's contained in a temporary order and it has served as the basis for prior contempt orders. Um, I do find, and I, I will approve and sign the contempt hearing as proposed by petitioner, including the inclusion of fees and costs. Um, it's clear to me, and this is separate and apart from, we'll talk about the business property here in a minute, but just focusing on contempt, it's clear to me that this Mr. Couch, uh, Ms. Couch has had to bring you back to court to address the same issues time and time and time again at cost to her. So I do find that there's a basis for this contempt motion that you have not obeyed the orders that are currently in effect. I find that the amounts listed um, are supported by the facts. And I think given the numerous times petitioner has had to be here to enforce these orders, um, I find that uh, award of fees and costs of $5,000 is appropriate. So I have signed that. I want to move on to the sale of the business property. And Ms. Ward, as soon as I get this order signed and dated, I have a couple of questions for you. I guess what troubles me about this, um, I, I guess not troubles the right word, but the questions I have. Mm -hmm. So when I look at this, there's a notice of trustee sale. Um, and in this notice of trustees sale, well, let me back up. Are we, are we all talking about the property on Barnes drive in Toledo? That's the notice of the trustee sale. That's also the business property that you're asking this court to approve the sale of. Correct. Correct. Okay. So when I look at this, what I see is that back in 2019, according to the documents, Brian Couch under his separate estate as grantor, um, granted to the Jarvis Family Trust this property. These folks are now as uh, trustees and beneficiaries and the mortgage servicers seeking the sale of the property. Do I have those facts correct so far? Yes. So it's my understanding that the Jarvis Family Trust, this was essentially a way of getting a loan for the property, a, a more unconventional approach. I have been in touch with the attorney who was hired by the Jarvis Family Trust and who has moved forward with the foreclosure process on their behalf, specifically to clarify whether that would it would be acceptable for us to sell the property through a private party sale. And he indicated that, yes, as long as they get their money, that's all they want. And that the reason that they are moving forward with the trustee sale is because a lot of times people will say they're going to sell the property and then they don't take any action and it continues to linger. And it's just been so long at this point that they just want to make sure that they get their money. So it's my understanding that as part of the foreclosure process, what is going to happen is that the amounts owed to the Jarvis Family Trust will be paid out of any sale, regardless of whether it's private or through a trustee sale. 
they are just wanting the property sold uh, so that they can get the amount owed back to them. And uh, the amount that is owed is also detailed in one of the emails that I provided as part of the uh, initial motion to sell um, the business property. Mm-hmm. Um, the the attorney on there uh, CC'd both me and uh, Mr. Couch to indicate how much was owing, how much would need to be paid to prevent the foreclosure action from moving forward. Um, and I also included some previous notices that had been sent to Mr. Couch that I was later provided with um, talking about how much needed to be paid to get current on the payments due to the Jarvis Family Trust to prevent this from continuing to move forward. But again, the boat has or the train has continued to move forward. And uh, as I said, I have been in touch with that attorney. And if we are able to sell it privately before November 3rd, uh, then we we have the blessing to do that. Uh, they just want their money. And I appreciate that information. You are an officer of the court. I don't have any reason to disbelieve that, you know, you've had these conversations with the attorneys. This is where I feel my hands are tied, though, without some additional input from the beneficiaries. What I see, I mean, please jump in um, after I kind of say this and give me your feedback. I don't see where I have judicial authority in the dissolution proceeding to sign this order today. What I see is that a notice of trustee sale in a, in a separate proceeding where Brian Couch is as part of his separate estate, according to the deed, um, had granted this to the Jarvis Family Trust for whatever reason. Um, and now the, the trustees and beneficiaries want it sold. The way to object to that would be an action separate from this family law proceeding. And I don't know if that process has taken place or if, like you said, there's been, there's some other agreement between Ms. Couch and the beneficiaries. Um, I don't see sitting here today without that additional information from the parties in interest to the sale Mm -hmm. that I could grant this motion today. Um, I don't know if you've instituted the the chapter 61 um, objection to the sale. I think that would be important to the court. So I, I have a question. Uh, would so this is basically the issue that yeah. I, that I yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, so number one, we could certainly get um, a letter from the attorney uh, basically saying, that we have the blessing to sell it through a private property uh, sale. So, so if your honor wanted to make an order that was contingent upon us providing that information directly from uh, the the attorney representing the Jarvis Family Trust, I could certainly provide that as a submission. Um, I'm also trying to be uh, aware of my clients' costs and fees, and and as bringing separate motions. Uh, the main issue here is that you know the business property. It is a a property purchased during the marriage. It is community property. And really, it's the only asset left that that we know for sure is still around at this point in time. Um, The the issue is um, Mr. Couch to date has refused to sell it, even though it is going to be sold on November 3rd. And so what we are looking for is some authorization from the court that if the Jarvis Family Trust agrees that the property may be sold through a private party, that Ms. Couch may take control of that sale, that she can work with a realtor, that it can get listed, um, and that she can approve you know, the amount to, that it's going to be sold for because clearly Mr. Couch is, is not on board to sell it is allowing it to go to a trustee sale. And we just want to make sure that that's not, he's not going to interfere in that process. Because again, this is really the the, the major asset in this case. And given the debts owed, uh, it's, it's really the only opportunity to recoup any of those funds. So if your honor would my suggestion would be to phrase the order um, in in such a way where uh, if we provide documentation confirming that the Jarvis Family Trust approves the property being sold through a private party sale in advance of the trustee sale in order to pay off the debt owed to them, that Ms. Couch uh, would be allowed to be in charge of working with a real estate agent and getting that sold. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Mr. Couch, you wanted to respond? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. the petitioner filed for legal separation in 2018, did that, she asked if she could come back. I never asked her to leave. She came back. 
anything past that, she didn't want anything to do with the, she didn't want anything to do with the business start with. The business property that when I bought the property, she insisted on signing a quit claim deed because she wanted nothing to do with it. Against my um, advice, she wouldn't listen to me. I asked her, why would you do that? She didn't want anything to do with it. Our marriage counselor, who is a businessman, has 10 different businesses. He, he quizzed her on it and said, you know that, that you know, you're still liable for it, but you have, you're giving up all your claims. She knew that. Her brother-in-law, who's actually involved in this, found out, paid for the appraisal and is helping her along. He's a commercial real estate developer and realtor. And I think he's involved trying to sell this property. Um, and so she signed a quit claim deed. Even the lady, when we filled it out at the closing, she looked at the document like, what is this? And, but the petitioner insisted on signing it. She wanted nothing to do with it. Okay. And now, since she thinks it's worth more, that she's trying to claim it. She's already signed a quit claim. And this, and for Miss Ward to say that, oh, I'm just letting this go to a foreclosure is far from the truth. I'll try everything. In fact, this has already happened once before, and I was able to to settle that. And Mr. Couch, are you are you planning to put the property up for sale versus letting it go through the trustee sale? No, I'm not planning on letting it go. I would like the petitioner to stop this craziness of of trying to. Well, that's not my. Hold the, on, sir. That's not my yeah, question. I'm, hold on. My question isn't a, isn't about her. My question is about: Are you putting it up for private sale? I'm not at this at this time. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm. Okay. But it's it's like. Thank, I, thank yeah. you. So here's going to be my ruling on the order or the motion uh, for this court to sign an order to sell business property. Um, I'm going to deny it without any prejudice to the parties to bring this back with additional information. I'm not necessarily going to direct um, or give advice on what I think that information for should be, but I would say that my motion or my order to deny today is based on this court, based on the evidence in front of me today, um, does not have jurisdiction to enter this order um, or authority, excuse me, to enter this order in the dissolution case. If the parties, Ms. Ward, as you stated, perhaps there's some additional information to bring forward to this court, um, I will happily readdress the issue at that time and we can renote it um, on this docket. Okay. Um, okay. Your I'm Honor, I would just like it. Your Mr. Honor, Couch, go ahead. Could I, I just like it to be on record that now Ms. Ward is saying this business property, business property, they've maintain that this is my residence okay and which sir, now it is my residence sir, sir yes i've, I've made record. yep i've made my ruling yeah but i just wanted on on record that this is where i live this isn't just some separate business okay. this is my only thank place you. of residence okay thank you mr couch thank you Do the parties have any further um items that we need to address today no okay thank you all for your time i will get this the um, order I signed filed with the court um, and anyone can get copies here in the next little bit from the clerk's office. I Thank actually, you. I have, I have just one brief question. Okay. Would it be possible to uh, cite a review hearing on the motion just to prevent having to do a, an additional motion, an additional motion in order to shorten time, just given the time frame we have with the trustee sale, could we please cite a review motion? And I will see if I can supplement the motion with additional information for the court that might make the court feel more comfortable to authorize the sale at that time. And if for any reason, the additional information I provide is still, still the court doesn't feel that they're authorized to do so, then you know, then it can be denied at, at that point, but it would save my clients substantial attorney fees uh, if we could just cite a review hearing on it. So my only concern with that is since I've denied the motion in its entirety, I wouldn't be setting a review. So I do think that the, the process you would need to go through is once you are ready to have this reheard, go ahead and recite yeah, it on. But thank you for the question. Uh, okay. Respectively. Thank you, thank you. And there they are. Great. Thank you. And are, are either of your clients present? Yes, Your Honor. My client is here in the court, or she's here on Zoom today. Great, great. Thank you. Ms. And Hatt. Your Honor, my client, I believe, is not present. Um, he is working today. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so we're here today uh, related to the, the reunification counselor. And if the parties have agreed, uh, you'll let me know that. If you haven't agreed, then you'll let me know that. And then we'll we'll go from there. So uh, is there, I, I think there's not an agreement, but uh, you sure. can 
There is actually, Your Honor. Um, We do have an agreement. I did draft a proposed order, um, got it to you this morning. However, um, Ms. Dow hasn't had a chance to change it. But more importantly, I did send it to our agreed um, supervisor, Mr. or Dr. Lundell. Um, We both spoke to him. We both have agreed on him. Um, I just wanted to get an order in place that kind of has all the parties knowing exactly what they're doing, having specific times, having my client have specific boundaries in the lot, kind of need his input since he'd be the one doing it. Um, not sure what you want to do if we can just appoint today and then maybe set a presentation for the order so we can get that back from him and have you review it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Winkles, Ms. Ms. Dow? Um, Your Honor, I, um, as Ms. Winkle said, she sent out this proposed order this morning. I, While we were waiting here, I had a chance to just quickly review it. Um, there are a couple of nuts and bolts items that I think Ms. Winkles is correct. We're going to have to work that out with the counselor. Um, but there are a couple of things that I object to and would ask the court not to include in the order. Do you have that order in front of you? Ms. Winkles, was it uh, forwarded to me electronically or was it a hard copy that was forwarded to the court? It was a hard copy forwarded to you at about 8.30 this morning. Uh, and again, my apologies. I, I sent it last week to the counselor because I obviously, or the, the doctor, to get his um, his input, but we didn't hear back. So we kind of just forwarded it to the court today. If they a hard copy, just Your Honor, if, if it's, I don't want to take up the court's time with this. Um, as I said, most of it, the things that I question would be uh, arrangements that we have to confirm with the doctor. But there are a couple of things. Item number five, that the counselor shall, or sorry, that the father shall not be involved. That was not only not ordered, that is not practical to put in an order because essentially it says that the counselor can't talk to dad, which is not going to help matters here if the counselor decides he needs to. The second thing that I object to is item nine. Uh, says that the reunification counselor may suggest the father be referred to alientation-oriented treatment. Again, that was not ordered. Um, There's no evidence anywhere that my client has attempted to alienate the child. Um, I feel that should not be suggested in an order of the court. Um, And then the only other concern that I had about this order is that somewhere... uh, uh, It does say, as the court ordered, that the reunification counseling is to be counselor-led. I agree with that. Uh, The reunification counselor shall act in the best interests of the child. The court order included the language specifically, and this is very important to my client, that uh, the child's wishes be taken into account. Um, He's old enough and mature enough to make some decisions about what he wants to do and the pace he wants to proceed at. Um, so I would ask that that be reflected in the order uh, that is on record with the court. Other than that, I believe, uh, as I said, we can work out the specific arrangements with the counselor. I agree with Ms. Winkles that it should be set forth clearly, uh, clear objectives, clear rules, and some clear timing, at least insofar as the counselor agrees that he can do that. Thank you, Ms. Dell. Ms. Winkles? Yes, Your Honor. Um, The father not being involved, this is reunification counseling between the child and the mother. Um, Having read up a significant amount of information that Dr. Lundell um, has put up online in his own post, um, it appears that reunification counseling is exactly that. It is reunification of a child and an alienated parent. And alienation being however it happened, be it that parent's fault, be it, uh, you know, uh, be it jail, be it whatever, in any event, It is between those two individuals only. And the main benefit is for the child. Uh, Father's involvement should only be child. If child is old enough to decide whether or not he wants to do this, there really is no reason to discuss anything with father. If counselor needs to do that for some sort of safety issue, that's a different story. But if we're talking about getting dad's opinion, that's not what this is about. This isn't about trying this matter again. This isn't about counseling. It's literally about what the, the best interest of the child in trying to form a bond. These two parties are so adversarial that it makes no sense to have dad there. Um, My client shouldn't be talking about the case either. Really, the only thing that should be going on in those rooms is building a bond between child and mother. There should be nothing else about what's happened in the past, what anything uh, to do with this case, anything to do with the adversary, er, the adversarial issues. It really shouldn't be like that. If you look up any of the American Medical Journal um, issues on reunification counseling and on mental health of children, really having this sort of drama, which will happen if we have both parties involved, 
um, is damaging to the child. So I'd ask that the father not be involved unless it's an emergency or unless the counselor absolutely believes it's a necessity. In that event, he's a doctor. He can he can absolutely make up his mind. But did dad just have a say in this forming of the bond doesn't make any sense. Um, the reason I put in the alienation oriented treatment, if uh, if your owner does have it in front of him, you'll notice the next line is, and the reunification counselor can suggest treatment for mother as well of different types. Um, the reason for this is again, um, trying to get both of these parties in on board, not saying dad alienated, not saying anything of that nature, just saying both of these parties involved to help this child. That's really what we're here for. While we both represent alternate uh, different people on opposite sides, really what we're looking at is how to get this child to the best point he can possibly be for his future. That's the only reason that it's in there. Put in just you know, good for the goose is good for the gander. I put in treatment for my client as well. This wasn't to point out anything to Dan. We can take away alienation oriented and just have treatment for both of them. Um, counseling is never a bad idea. Treatment is never a bad idea, especially if it helps the child. Um, the counselor led best interest of the child. Um, that came from um, the horse's mouth himself, Dr. Lindell. That is what he does is he looks at the best interest of the child. That takes into account what the child wants. If the child doesn't want to do it, Dr. Lundell is not going to force the child to do it. It is in the best interest of what the child wants. That doesn't mean pushing the child. That means actually listening to the child and seeing if even if the child wants it, maybe it's not in the best interest to go as fast as the child may want, things of that nature. That's why we put in the best interest. Um, if we add a line in that says, absolutely, child's wishes are, are listened to, child's wishes are taken into account. I have no problem with that because that's really what this is about. This is about the child more than it's about either parent. So I guess kind of to summarize, I'd ask that the father not be involved. I think that's really important unless it's an emergency. I'd ask that if the counselor, if Dr. Lendell suggests treatment for both, um, he can suggest it. It didn't mean that they had to go. It just means that he's able to suggest it. Finally, if we interlineate a line that says um, the child's wishes are taken into account, I have no problem with that. Your Honor, if I may. Um... But I don't disagree with anything that Ms. Winkles has said. Um, however, in the interest of uh, simplifying matters with the court, um, the reason that we all agreed that it needed to be a PhD level uh, psychologist, therapeutic counselor was so that they can make these sorts of decisions during the course of their uh, uh, services to both of our clients and to the child. Um, so I am asking that uh, the provision that father not be involved, that's not a decision on the part of the counselor as it's presented, that's an order of the court. And I think that that really um, should be up to the counselor rather than being included in the court order. Um, other than that, I think that uh, we can probably move forward and present the court with an agreed order. But I really strongly think that a court ordering father not to be allowed to be involved is going to be counterproductive. Thank you both for your for your input, and I appreciate the agreement on on the counselor and the work that went into that. Uh, that's much much appreciated. Uh, related to the order that's been presented, I, I don't have a copy of it, but I've listened carefully to what the parties have said, so I, I feel like I have a fairly good just just of the the three items that have been raised. Point number five, where there's a specific provision that the father should not be involved in the process. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to re remove that um, and really defer to the, the PhD led or PhD uh, psychotherapist and allow him to, to guide and implement whatever supports that he feels may be appropriate because it may be very, very appropriate for the father to be involved depending on the child's needs. Who, who am I to say, or it may not be. So I'll allow the PhD counselor to, to guide that and provide that. So that, that, that provision that says a specific exclusion of one parent uh, that should be removed. And that was on paragraph five. Number Paragraph number nine is that uh, referring the father out to some type of alienation treatment. Again, I, 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 I feel that uh, it, it would be improper for me to circumscribe or put limits on the PhD counselor's broad array of tools that could be utilized um, if the PhD counselor feels that that would be helpful for the, ch the child and the reunification process, uh, whatever that may be, and if it's reasonable and within treatment standards, uh, have at it. Um, I'm, I'm not one to uh, say that that's inappropriate. So uh, that that I, I think maybe the the spe specificity of the particular type of treatment that could be 
ordered uh, maybe is too specific that we should maybe be more general in, in deferring to the, the treatment guidelines and recommendations from the, the, from the counselor. Um, so, you know, the, the specificity, I have a little bit of concern with that. So if we could make it more general uh, and defer to the greater knowledge and, and skills of that counselor would be helpful. And then I think taking into account the, the child's wishes is important. I think the counselor should take into account all parties' interests uh, because more, more eyes and more mouths on the, on the issue is, is helpful uh, to hear from the perspectives from all, I think probably provides a better end product, if you will. Uh, so uh, to, to exclude one or to emphasize one party over the other, I think it's important for all parties to be heard and then the clinician can make uh, or put what weight or value on each of input as, as is appropriate. So I don't know if that gives the parties enough guidance. I don't have the document in front of me, but maybe with those comments, uh, an agreed order could be drafted. Do you feel fairly comfortable with that or not? I, I do, Your Honor. I, I, can, I can get rid of those things, kind of change them up and send them back to Ms. Dow and also to the, the counselor himself, because I do need some assistance on dates and, and timelines and anything that he, he may have changes. Yep. Ms. Winkles, we can maybe speak um, later on today or tomorrow about how we can work that out. So maybe we can both talk with the counselor to uh, just figure out scheduling and so forth. Yep. I'll double I'll check to see Ms. Cotto is present okay. and I'll see if Ms. Fowler is present. Ms. Fowler, are you here today? Ms. Fowler? Usually she's here. Uh, so Ms. Fowler, I'm, I'm not hearing you. So just make sure you're unmuted and, and let me know uh, if you can hear me and let us know that you're here. Yeah, I'm not seeing her there. Ms. Cotto, any contact with Ms. Fowler? No, Your Honor. Um, I filed uh, the order, and I also included with that order uh, over at the clerk's office the discovery request, as you had instructed. Um, I have not been supplied any address because she said she was going to be part of that witness protection program. I haven't been supplied with any information, so I've continued to use the clerk's office as ordered. Okay. I do have a copy of your proposed order. Uh, it looks like it's in order, and I've signed off on that. Okay, and then we'll be before your honor next week to check the status and of Mr. Discovery. Hinton is representing okay. himself. So let's all check right, all parties you. are here. Ms. Bliss is present. And yeah. great. Welcome. And then I'll ask if Mr. Mr. Jason Hinton is, is present. Jason Hinton, are you here? I'm not hearing a response from Mr. Hinton. Mr. Hinton, if you if you are online, make sure that you're unmuted and please uh, speak up and state your name. Okay, I'm not hearing a response. It looks like this is, we're on today. It looks like there was a, a CR2A that Commissioner Nelson drafted up uh, from April 27th. And there's, uh, it was, I think there was about eight discrete items or seven discrete items on that CR2A. And that there was a pro proposed order that's been filed. Let me just pull that up here along with some final testimony documents and findings. The, uh, I didn't see any objection filed by Mr. Hinton. Ms. Bliss, did you receive any, any objection from him? I did not, Your Honor. Okay. And then as far as, let me just double check, since I was expecting him to be here and I didn't uh, check on service, it looks like there is proof of mailing. The letter indicates that uh, the matter was set to July 11th and that was uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Nelson set that, correct? No, Your Honor, so this was initially set uh, for last week's uh, docket. However, given uh, Commissioner Nelson is no longer here, uh, Judge Scudder was uh, on the docket that day. He had a judicial conflict as he previously represented Mr. Hinton. He then instructed me to come today uh, and, and set it over to Your Honor's docket. I did send a letter to Mr. Hinton last week, which I have filed with the court as well. My assistant sent that out on the uh, 6th, uh, and I indicated to him that we were before the court um, the day before, that the court had set the matter over to July 11th uh, at 9 a.m., and I again enclosed um, the clerk's minutes and um, the documentation that had been previously served upon him. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I see that there was a, a note for uh, um, the, the docket on July 5th that was sent to Mr. Hinton on July 5th. Mr. Hinton was not in attendance, and then I also see confirmation of, of, of proof of mailing of the letter regarding the, the new court date, which also includes the, the court minutes uh, from, from July 5th, and also an indication that the case is set to today. Uh, Judge Scudder set it to today at, at 9 a.m. So uh, Mr. Hinton's not here. Uh, looks like he was given proper notice, and he's uh, not uh, filed any, any objections. So I have the proposed findings and also the uh, dissolution decree uh, prepared by Ms. Press. She represents Michael so Miller sign off on and Angel Amasquita. Um, looks like you're online. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, welcome to you. Ms. Holder, let me just double check to see if Mr. you're anticipating Mr. Miller being present today. I am not. And I just want to point out that on the docket, this is listed as a recusal. And the order, I believe, that we had filed with the court was for a modification of child support. Okay. Um, just double checking the recusal. I looked at it yesterday. It looks like it was Commissioner Nelson based on uh, involvement in a uh, mandatory settlement conference. Yeah, and just a, just and the clerk mentions that it's just a flag there to give everybody notice. Okay. Not necessarily on I just that. wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so let me double check. So, um, so it's on for for child child support. Um, it looks like my, Ms. Amasquita was was served, and Ms. Amasquita provided documentation as far as taxes uh, from 2022, and gave some uh, detail about mortgage and costs and expenses. And then what I what I didn't see. Uh, and maybe let me just pull it up here. Um, what I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, uh, is information as far as financials from from Mr. Miller. So let me check with Ms. Ms. Holder to see if I've missed something or if, if documents were, were filed. No, Your Honor, you haven't missed anything. I believe because it was listed on the, like we saw it on the docket from my office as the recusal, it got through the cracks. And so we were not able to respond um, after our initial motion. So I don't know if the court would like to set this matter over to get that information or if you would be okay being heard based on the information that is just in Ms. Amosquita's motion or her response. Okay. Well, my, my initial sense is it's, it's probably fair to all parties to have all the information that's going to be presented to the court uh, at, at the hearing. Ms. Amosquita hasn't seen the information from, from Mr. Miller. So it strikes me as it would seem uh, more equitable to have everybody have the same information and from that present their cases uh, with that in mind. So my preference would be to set it over two weeks to the 25th uh, so everybody can have a look at all the information that's on the table. And let me check with Ms. Amasquita if, uh, if we were to set this over two weeks, and then that would allow you to look at Mr. Miller's information and uh, be better prepared for the hearing. Do you, do you have any concerns with that? Is that for me, for me or Ms. Amasquita? Um, not for Ms. I do not have any concerns with that. Okay. No, I'm fine. Just setting it over. Okay. So you're fine, Ms. Amasquita, setting it over to the 25th of July? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, let's do that. We'll get those financials from, the, from, from Mr. Miller and we'll be in a better position to address that. So we will see everybody on the 25th of July Dow at 9 o'clock. Representing Tyson okay, Llewellyn, Ms. Dow is present. And I show that... Um, Kirby Llewellyn, um, are you on the line today? Yes, I am. Okay, very good. Welcome to you. And I see that Mr. Tyson Llewellyn is also on the line. So welcome to, to all of you today. Um, as far as today's motion, um, it looks like uh, we are on today for Mr. Llewellyn's motion. Uh, and, and I apologize, uh, Ms. Young, you, you're going by the name of, of Ms. Young. So if I, if I call you Ms. Llewellyn, my apologies, I'll call you, I'll address you as Ms. Young. Okay, thank you. So this is Mr. Llewellyn's motion to enforce a decree by sale of the home and also a motion related to that for attorney fees and um, on for also presentation it was in my notes, but I'm not, that's not popping out right now, but that's maybe the, the, the least of the concerns at this point. So with that oh. said, I've, I've reviewed the motion, I reviewed the previous decree that was entered in August of 2022 related to the home. Um, I've read information about uh, child support payments and also Ms. Ms. Blondin's involvement or representation of Ms. Young, um, and then the request for attorney fees. So I've reviewed that. So with that uh, teed up, Ms. Dow, if you'd like to uh, state your, your client's uh, perspective, then we'll hear from Ms. Young. Um, Your Honor, there have been a few developments since we filed this motion. Um, as we informed the court, uh, payments on the mortgage have been consistently late. My client is the only uh, party who is on the mortgage. And as you said, you've read the divorce decree, so you know about the communication arrangements and so forth. Um, the house is now actively scheduled for a foreclosure sale for it's either September 13th or September 15th. Um, the parties have uh, listed it for sale. Um, there have been some uh, viewings. Feedback from the realtor says that part of the uh, one of the sort of difficulties about getting an offer right off the bat, because it is a fairly nice place, is that it's in not great condition. There's some damage that occurred while Ms. Kirby 
was uh, occupying the home um, and that the floor coverings need cleaning. He, the feedback has been is that the whole place has a somewhat unpleasant smell. Um, that is not unusual in a house that's been lived in with kids and dogs and everything else. And we're not, uh, we're not uh, uh, offering Ms. Kirby any disrespect to her abilities as a housekeeper. However, the court's order on the divorce said that she was responsible for costs for keeping it clean, uh, getting it set up for sale if a sale was ordered. Um, we are asking the court to go ahead and confirm the order for the sale, um, even though it is already in progress. We don't want anybody backing out of this. Um, <clears throat> the reason we asked for attorney fees is that my client has spent a great deal of money uh, trying to make that divorce decree work. Uh, we explained what happened with child support order and the fact that my client paid every month as soon as he was notified that the DCS uh, enforcement action had not been completed. In fact, we were the ones that took steps to make sure that the DCS garnishment order did get into place. Um, so he's paid all his child support. Uh, even when child support was being paid, uh, the mortgage was still not being paid in full. The divorce decree put that responsibility squarely with Ms. Young. And uh, now the house is in foreclosure. And in order to uh, stop that, Mr. Kirby has again, or sorry, Mr. Uh, Llewellyn again has to ha come back to court and ask for orders. So we're asking $1,000 for attorney fees. That doesn't uh, cover everything that he's had to pay since the divorce decree was entered in trying to get this all enforced and, and allow him to comply with it. Um, I filed an amended proposed order a couple of weeks ago, which Ms. Young uh, was served with, that the proceeds from the sale uh, should be deposited in a trust account. I believe Ms. Young no longer has representation, so I would ask that it be deposited into our trust account because there are indications there's going to be some dispute over how those proceeds should be distributed. Um, so we're asking that we allow the sale to go through, allow the uh, uh, trust company uh, clear instructions about what to do with the check and we'll worry about the distribution once the house is sold and we avoid the foreclosure. Um, I think that pretty much covers why we are here today, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Dell. And your, your proposed order uh, addresses the, um, so it says Slate Law Firm IOLTA account. So that Yes. Is, okay, very yes. good. Okay, thanks. I just want to make sure, confirm that that was within the order that, is, that any sale proceeds would go to the trust. That's perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great. All right. So we've heard from um, Mr. Llewellyn's vantage point. Uh, Ms. Young, what's what's your vantage point as far as the uh, Ms. Ms. Dow is asking for an order? It sounds like everybody's in process of selling, home, getting it marketed, and the like. Uh, what what is she's asking that the order to sell the home be memorialized and that that uh, go forward? So, what, what's your take on all of this, Ms. Young? Um, obviously, I'm in it. You know, I agree to sell the home. Um, we tried listening listing it ourselves on the seventh of June. Um, and both of Mr. Llewellyn and I both agreed that, you know, maybe a realtor would be best since we were at a time crunch. Um, the ho home did get put into foreclosure due to, um, which it's here nor there at this point, but Tyson missed November and December child support payments. Um, the major issues with the home, the home is I have taken pictures before every showing, um, just so I had proof that the home is clean wonderful, whatever. It is the roof and the siding um, that does need done. And I have the email from our realtor who stated that, that, you know, I sent him the pictures before the showings and he agrees the home looks great, but roof and siding are major things that need to be fixed on the home. Um, that's needed to be done for the past 15 years, even while Mr. Llewellyn was living in the home still. Um, I, I, don't know what else. I agree for the home to be listed as it is right now. We just lowered the price uh, yesterday uh, for four twenty five down to three eighty five, and we both signed with that. Um, I don't agree to pay. I don't think it's fair that I pay Mr. Llewellyn's uh, attorney fees. Um, he's put us in this bind. It's I I, I can't afford it. Obviously, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Young. I appreciate that feedback. Ms. Dow, any, any follow-up? Well, Your Honor, I believe our submissions uh, set forth the events as they've occurred. 
Um, Mr. Llewellyn has not placed the parties in this bind. He is the one who has been making every effort to implement the divorce decree, uh, make sure that money was going into Ms. Young's household. Um, we are asking the court to enter our order. Uh, I believe the only thing that the order would change aside from the issue of attorney fees and payment of the proceeds into trust is that it would make very clear that the parties will be guided by the realtor. This is this is a, a sort of an emergency situation. We're facing a hard deadline for a trustee's sale on the property, which will benefit neither party. Um, so we're asking that the court enter our order. Ms. Dowdy, the, the one, one point you mentioned was that you wanted the order to make clear that it should specify that the real estate order, real estate agent guides. Right, right. Um, there was uh, there were a couple of days uh, delay while the parties discussed whether or not to lower the price. Um, Ms. Young is a rational adult and they agreed to lower the price because they are facing this looming deadline. Um, but I would like it memorialized in the order that the parties are to be guided by the realtor. Um, this house needs to get sold before the bank puts it up for an auction. Okay. Ms. Ms. Young, what are your thoughts as far as including language within the order that basically says that the party's decisions as far as uh, marketing, selling, price, all things related to the house uh, shall be guided by the realtor? I, that's fine. Okay. All right. And then, and, and Ms. Kirby, did you receive a copy of the proposed amended order to enforce the final divorce decree that talks about the sale of the home and the proceeds going to the trust account? Um, yeah. And I, that I didn't really, so I don't, trying to, so on one of the papers, and it might be that where they want to take out the back for missed payments, um, that prior August 12th, when our divorce was finalized, he wasn't getting penalized for putting the home in foreclosure. Um, he just had to pay the back support once the house sells. So I was kind of confused of why they were asking me to pay all these fees when Mr. Llewellyn put the home in foreclosure back in 2022. So are you referring, um, so I'm looking at that proposed amended order to enforce the final divorce decree. Does it, yeah. does it talk about there about as far as you paying particular fees or the like? Yeah, it was saying that, um, that it was 39,000 in miss 39,290 in missed payments. And that's with attorney fees and insurance and taxes. Yeah. And, and so, so I, I think that's what's needed to to bring it current, right? And to get it, bring it out of foreclosure? Yes, correct. Okay. So the, the, the language reads, it says, you know, the party shall immediately list the, the marital home. Both parties shall work and follow the recommendations of the realtor for listing and steps necessary to complete the sale. Uh, and then unless immediate a payment uh, by respondent in the amount of 39290 um halts the, the foreclosure. Are, are you in a position to come with $39,290 to halt the foreclosure? No, no. Okay. So maybe it's academic that the language is in there in that okay. it's really, really not a foreseeable happening, but the language I guess is in there that if um, some way you could do that, then the house would be a safe yeah. foreclosure. Um, so okay. I, I, I think with that input, um, then I will sign, sign the order and it also has that language already included related to the, the guidance by the, the recommendations of the realtor. So that language is already okay. there. So I'll sign off on that. As far as the attorney fees, um, I, I'm going to award $750 of attorney fees um, to Mr. Llewellyn. Uh, this is a kind of, I, I recognize I'm taking off a bit of what the request was because I think that there, there may have been some impact from the, the child support payments not being timely received. And so, um, and yet at the same time, there's a, a series of payments that had not been made. And uh, but for the push from Mr. Llewellyn, I don't know if we'd be here today with the house actively being marketed and showed, shown. Um, so that'll be part of the the order, and I've signed off on that that proposed or proposed amended order, and that'll be filed. And okay. Your Honor, if I may, I'd like to just go on record saying that we are fine with having those attorney fees deducted from the uh, final distribution of the proceeds from the sale of the home. We're not asking Ms. Young to come up with that now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
Yeah, that seems reasonable. Okay, very okay. good. Great. Um, thank, so you. Here, thank you. Uh, today for, right, looks like for today. the previous order related to passports and the like, that's and that's been signed and it's already been filed. So now we're on to the, the motion brought by Ms. Winkle's client, Ms. Gall, related to a motion for to have matters deemed admitted related to some discover, 20, 20 or so 20, uh, discovery questions that were posed to, to Mr. Gall. So I've reviewed the, the, the party's uh, pleadings that you've filed, and I have a nice timeline here of kind of where the case has been and um, and with Ms. Margraf entering into the case and then Ms. Margraf exiting the case and kind of the timelines. Um, so I'll hear from Ms. Winkles um, and then we'll hear from Mr. Gall, please. Yes, Your Honor. Um we originally served these um, about seven months ago. I actually believe it's seven months to the day. Um, and RFAs are obviously 30 days. Um, they, by When we filed this case on May 22nd, they still haven't been entered. Um, we did receive some sort of response on Friday, July 7th at 4.46 p.m. Um, now, normally, I it's not about the attorney fees. It's not about any of that. It's just about making sure that the trial is narrowed down enough so that we can get the issues. That's that's the purpose of RFAs. I am unable to do that. Um, I have a, a couple of issues. I'm not sure if Your Honor has seen the responses. I believe Mr. Gall filed them. Um, yeah, I, I, I have read the responses. It's basically an email uh, to sent to Ms. Margraf. Yes, and, and, and there's a number of issues. I, it's very clear on um, CR 36 request for admissions. It's very clear on how to answer these. Um, the answer shall specifically deny the matter set forth in detail the reasons why the party cannot truthfully answer or deny it. A denial shall fairly meet the substance of the que requested admission. And when good faith requires that a party clarify an answer or deny only the part of the matter of which an admission is requested, the party shall specify so much of it as is true and qual qualify or deny the remainder. Um, we don't have that here. Specifically RFA 2, RFA 4, RFA 13, RFA 15, RFA 17, and RFA 20 are nowhere in meet, nowhere come close to meeting CR 36. In fact, the answers um, make it almost more difficult. Um, they don't specifically answer or deny anything. Instead, what they do is they answer or deny some other question that wasn't asked. This makes it impossible for me to um, narrow the issues at court, but more than that, it makes it impossible for me to even know if they could have been narrowed. Um, if we are coming to some sort of problem and there's a factual dispute, that's fine, that goes to a trial. But the way these are answered, um, I can't tell either way. Um, I don't think anybody can. There's an objection which isn't allowed. Um, Ms. Winkles, let me just double check because when I'm looking at the court record, you're, you're, it sounds like you're referencing uh, specific, you know, enumerated responses. Yes. Uh, from Mr. Gall. So what I have from Mr. Gall that I've reviewed is I have a declaration which is related to the passports, which has already been dealt with by an order. And then I have a, a two-page declaration from Mr. Gall that indicates that I submitted answers to the respondent's request for admissions on February 20th to my attorney, and that's signed. And then there's a, 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 a copy of an email that has a copy of a PDF uh, kind of a icon, but I don't have anything else. Ah, okay. Your Honor, if, case, I may, if I may respond to that, or if I may weigh in on that. Well, yeah, just tell, tell me tell me uh, where that's at and why I, I don't have it. I, yes, I, absolutely, I, Your Honor. Good. Absolutely, Your Honor. I attempted to file these answers uh, with the courthouse, but the courthouse had alerted me that uh, these answers do not need to be filed with them and that they need to be presented directly to the attorney. Unfortunately, my work had me traveling for the last week and a half prior to my submissions. And so I fell sick, and that, that was the reason for the delay. In my response, I submitted my efforts to try to answer these questions back in February, which is the uh, which is the declaration that I submitted, sir. Um, but since I let me let me interrupt you, if I may, Mr. Gall. Yes, um, could one or both parties forward forward to me via email a copy of of the response? Yeah, I can do it right now, Your Honor. Okay. Whoever has it easy, up and easy, that would be great. And Ms. Winkles, it looks like you're doing that. And so we'll, if you could send it to me and CC a copy to, to Mr. Gall, so he, he knows what's happening. Absolutely. And just for the court may know, Your Honor, I welcome any open discussions to an attempt to resolve these matters and answer them properly. I'm not trying to hide anything. It's just, I don't have the money to uh, represent to hire representation at this point. And in my previous efforts to have an attorney, 
I thought that, you know, that these answers were sufficient because I didn't hear back from my previous attorney. It is. So. All right. Thanks. Elizabeth said. All right. And the county has a beefy, beefy uh, uh, firewall. So let me just refresh here repeatedly and we'll see. Well, I was anticipating it would have been received received by now, but who knows, sometimes with servers and the like and their timeframes. Um, I'm wondering if, because um, the next matter up um, isn't necessarily a short matter. So I'm willing to indulge in about another 30 seconds of me refreshing the send and receive button in hopes that that will somehow pull that email in, just like when you press the crosswalk button super fast, do you think it's making a difference? So, and, and have, Your Honor, that's fine if we wait. I'm due in the minor guardianship docket right now anyway, so I can always pop back in. Okay. Well, it's it hasn't come in yet. So what I'd like to do rather than just uh, just waiting um, is to, to pause, and then I can address the Rich, Ritzer and Ritzer matter, and then we can come back to this and finish up with it. Sounds good. Thank you. Today for uh, an amended motion for reunification filed by uh, Ms. Dow's client, Mr. Mr. Ritzer. Ritzer. Um, so I've reviewed um, Dr. Kirk, Kirk Johnson's November report. Um, I've reviewed uh, the June 28, 2022 temporary order. Um, I reviewed a May 18, 2022 submission that had over 100 pages. So I'm familiar with that, familiar with the temporary parenting plan filed in July of 2018. Um, and and the pleadings that were filed by by both parties, I've, I've reviewed those in preparation for today. So I think I'm up to speed. And if I've missed something, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, we'll hear from, from Ms. Dow to start off. Um, Your Honor, um, as you say, most of our supporting material was filed in May last year uh, when we filed the initial motion for reunification between Mr. Richer, is how you say his name, um, and his daughter, Twyla. Uh, at the time, Commissioner Cotterell required my client to meet the letter of the 2018 Temporary Parenting Plan and have an additional uh, psychosexual evaluation with a parental risk component, uh, which my client has completed and submitted. Um, since the incident in 2016, there have been several accounts, um, somewhat inconsistent, reflecting the perspective of both of the parties involved here um, about exactly what happened. All that information is contained in our submission, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, my client has complied with everything that's been required of him. Uh, he obtained an additional uh, evaluation with parental risk assessment in November of last year so that he was compliant with the specific language of the 2018 parenting plan. Um, Dr. Kirk Johnson did the evaluation. He was offered access to any previous court uh, records that he thought might be helpful. He had, and that included any statements by Ms. Anderson. He had access to all of the Oregon material, uh, which forms a fairly complete picture of the situation. Um, Ms. Anderson's responsive declaration now asserts that a different type of assessment should have been done. Um, however, if you'll read uh, both her declaration and Dr. Johnson's report and the reports that came out of my client's uh, therapy in Oregon, uh, most if not all of those tests have been done or the subject matter of those tests has been touched on in either his evaluations or his therapy. Um, she also asserts that the court found that my client has voluntarily abandoned his child. Commissioner Cotterell did make that finding. Um, however, uh, that doesn't take into account the circumstances. He was prevented from contacting the child until he had met every requirement of both the Washington and Oregon courts, uh, both the criminal court in Oregon and the Washington family court. Uh, meeting his probation and, and uh, reporting requirements, getting the evaluations ordered by the court, uh, making sure he was completely in compliance took time. Um, added to that was scheduling for the additional evaluation that was required last winter. I think we're all aware of the time delays that can be involved in there. And uh, uh, if you take that together with the impact that a client's resources have uh, on getting back into court, the delay, it, it's it's unfortunate but it was not something that my client voluntarily did. He didn't just ignore this and hope it was gonna go away and pretend his daughter didn't exist. Um, 
as far as some of the other assertions in Ms. Richard's reply declaration, and we're not objecting to timeliness on these things. Uh, as the court may be aware, Ms. Uh, Noel is going to be out of town, and we would like to get this addressed and get started because it's going to take a good deal of time. Um, so I'm answering them more or less off the cuff here. Um, <clears throat> uh, she made some assertions about my client being a liar uh, based on statements about alcohol use and the information she was bringing to the court was based on some financial records that were produced uh, for back in 2020, early 2021, I believe. Um, apparently, she doesn't know that the bars that showed up on his bank records are pubs where he eats. One was quite close to where he lived and one is right next to the hobby shop where he goes for gaming and he builds models. Um, information about what he might have purchased at a liquor store two years ago and why is also non-existent. It's not really relevant here. Um, she also included the report from Keith Lawrence, who did the home evaluation when Ms. Anderson was trying to have my client's parental rights terminated so that her then spouse, uh, Cassie Anderson, could adopt the child. Um, Mr. Lawrence noted that uh, Ms. Anderson felt that Mr. Richer had been uh, a good father to Twyla. Um, and this is a mother who has fought my client every step of the way. Um, she noted to the GAL that he had been a good father to Twyla, to Twyla but he had some mental health issues. Um, those mental health issues, clearly from the records that we've submitted, he has been working on, he has addressed. Uh, the value of that report in other respects is somewhat limited at this point. Um, Ms. Anderson, uh, both of the Ms. Andersons uh, are engaged in a divorce that occurred not long after that uh, petition for termination was filed. Um, my client is not asking to take custody of this child. He's not asking to push for immediate visitation um, or do anything without the support and guidance of a mental health professional. Uh, any safety plans that the court might want to see or a reunification counselor might want to see would have to be developed with the input from that counselor. Um, I'll, just as an aside, we've identified three local therapists, one of whom I spoke to last week. Uh, that was Barbara uh, Brett Brandhurst, I believe her name is. She has room to take on another client. So we could get started on the process, which, you know, I'll remind the court, even though we all know this, it does not start with contact between the parent and the child. It starts with the parent and the counselor. Um, the last order uh Commissioner Cotterell ordered that a GAL would have to be appointed and evaluate whether or not it, reunification was appropriate. Um, our position is that a reunification therapist is going to be able to say whether or not it's appropriate. Um, appointing a GAL at this point in the game would result in additional costs for my client, additional delays. Um, we think that it would be somewhat um, the information would be overlapping and at this point, not necessary. Uh, it wouldn't provide anything new. Um, so we're asking the court to allow my client to begin the process of reestablishing a relationship with his daughter. Uh, as far as the issues of his status, uh, legal status, registration <laughs> as a sex offender and so forth, um, as you pointed out, you did read all of the materials that we submitted. Um, <laughs> Oregon is apparently so backed up that we still don't have official leveling, um, but all indications are that he's going to be designated as a level one offender. Um, I can't speak with any authority about Oregon law. I'm not licensed to practice in Oregon, but some research uh, would show what that level one offender uh, registration means in Oregon and uh, the the uh, status that it would uh, imply in Washington as well. He lives in Oregon. He doesn't live in Washington. Um, he doesn't intend to live in Washington, so he's not required to register here. Um, all of the information supports that he is either at no risk or very low level risk to reoffend. Um, I believe that the, uh, the equivalent criminal designation, criminal complaint in Washington would be for voyeurism, and the Oregon court lacks all of the intent requirements for Washington. Um, this was, as, as he has stated consistently and uh, uh, 
under examination using a polygraph, he's not really sure why he did what he did. Um, he was under the influence of a combination of extreme mental distress, emotional distress, uh, I believe somewhat unsupervised use of Adderall and alcohol, and he did something really stupid, something that he has said consistently that he regrets, that he found revolting. He's not going to do it again, and I believe that we could set any sort of uh, safety precautions in place and allow him to move forward with getting back in touch with his daughter. So we're asking the court to grant our order today. Thank you, Ms. Dell. Ms. McLean? Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, on behalf of Ashley Anderson, uh, we are asking the court to, again, deny uh, the requested relief. Uh, as you've indicated, you've reviewed through all of the documentation and the temporary order that was entered on June 28th of 22 was very specific. Uh, and that specific order was that he was to complete his psychosexual evaluation and a parental risk evaluation. And if you go back to the 2018 parenting plan at paragraph four, it specifically indicates he's to complete both a psychosexual evaluation as well as a parental risk evaluation. Those are- Your question on that? I'm sorry? Just as far as the language, is it, is it, is it, was it ordered that I took notes, but I didn't do verbatim. Is, is it a psychosexual evaluation with a parental risk assessment or is it a psychosexual evaluation period, a parental risk assessment period? So paragraph four of the temporary order parenting plan entered in 2018 says, Evaluation or treatment required, Daniel Richer must be evaluated for psychosexual evaluation and parental risk assessment. Thanks. And those are two unique um, evaluations. Um, granted, I did prepare the order uh, that was entered in June of uh, June 28th of 22, and that uh, did uh, erroneously uh, nomenclature that the prior temporary parenting plan. If you look at that temporary order. Um, and I've outlined this in my client's uh, first page of my client's declaration under the specific findings. It says um, at paragraph one, he's failed to provide proof and verification of his participation in a psychosexual evaluation. And it says with parental risk components. Um, and that should have been and parental risk evaluation, quite frankly. Um, but uh, because it as specifically references, it goes on to say, as required in the temporary parenting plan entered on June 24 of 2018. So the specific provisions of the parenting plan are that he's to complete both of those evaluations. Suggestions from Ms. Dow's argument is that he has complied with that and that the prior um, evaluations uh, included those testing schedules that would be required for a parental risk um, assessment. Parental risk assessments look at parent stress indexes. Uh, it looks at competency to parent. Uh, it provides for other um, standardized testing to determine the appropriateness of his parenting and whether or not there would be risks uh, that would present for this child. None of those standardized tests that are utilized in a parental risk evaluation have been conducted with Mr. Richard. What he's done is he's completed a psycho sex evaluation with Dr. Johnson uh, and the two additional batteries that he provided um, uh, were specifically related to his, his risk to reoffend as a sex offender. Um, so that's the initial uh, starting point from our position is that he's not complied with the plain language of the order that's been in place for the last seven years. Uh, let's see four and three, yeah, for the last seven years since, no, I'm sorry, five years, last five years, since 2018. Um, in addition, uh, in reviewing the evaluation that was completed by Dr. Uh, Johnson, it continues to be concerning that the original parenting plan didn't require collateral input. The majority of the time, the court orders collateral input just to make sure that there is an accurate disclosure of information to the uh, evaluator. I don't see in Dr. Johnson's report, unless I missed it, and granted, I've only been involved in this case for five days at this point, uh, again. Um, so I reviewed Dr. Johnson's evaluation on uh, Sunday, uh, two days ago, and I don't recall him disclosing that he had reviewed the case file or, or uh, declarations from my client. He certainly didn't receive input from my client, and my client outlines concerns about inconsistencies in reports by Mr. Richard of factual issues that would affect, potentially affect Dr. Johnson's conclusions. 
for example, um, it's interesting that Mr. Richer in his declaration, I'm sorry, in his report to Dr. Johnson states that he didn't intend to video record the 12 year old child. Uh, counsel glosses over that today in her argument and says, no, that he's done what he needed to do and he's taken responsibility. But he specifically told Dr. Johnson this last, uh, was it this last year when he met with Dr. Johnson? Uh, November of 2022. So he told Dr. Johnson specifically that that wasn't his intent. So he's minimizing his culpability, which if he's going to minimize what he did, then he's not going to actively participate or uh, have those factors addressed in that counseling. Mr. Richer admitted to his former girlfriend, uh, Ms. DeSella, he admitted to my client, and he admitted in open court in Island County Superior Court during the probation, I'm sorry, during the protection order hearing that he had in fact intended to video record this 12-year-old child, and um, ultimately he was charged for that. Uh, Mr. Richard's testing with Dr. Johnson shows that he was defensive and attempting to portray himself favorably uh, with Dr. Johnson. And while counsel again suggests that it's not relevant uh, as it relates to Mr. Richard's minim minimization of his alcohol use, the fact that one of his claims is that he committed this, again, another attempt to minimize, he only committed this crime against this 12-year-old child because he was under the influence of alcohol, Adderall, and had underlying mental health issues. Go back to the May, uh, May 18th submission. Uh, the, that's the motion, the original motion that Mr. Richer filed. And this is identified as Exhibit F. So as of April 6, 2018, Mr. Richer is placed on 24 months of probation. That probation wouldn't be up until April of 2020. Uh, in his report to Dr. Johnson, he indicates that he was compliant with probation with the exception of one time when he was violated for consuming a beer. So if you then go back to my client's financial documents that she produced that were uh, uh, of, they were produced by Mr. Richard through the adoption court case. And if you go back to those sealed financial source documents, those financial records start as of January of 2020. And as of January of 2020, and I'm sorry, the actual statements start February 13th. You see multiple saloons, taverns, bars, and you also see um, him going into and making purchases from uh, liquor stores, uh, particularly uh, January 30, oh, I guess they do start January. So uh, January 30th of 2020, there's Oregon Liquors for $36.65. Um, I will tell you that the, the Wild Hair, Hanko's Sports Bar, um, 1933 in Westland, Oregon, and the Westland Saloon also appear to be areas where um, he easily could have uh, consumed alcohol in conjunction with his claim that he's been consuming on average a beer a day. Um, again, uh, the records from March of 2020, uh, you have uh, one, two, three purchases from Oregon liquor stores, not including facilities or establishments that also um, sell alcohol. And then in April, uh, you have uh, one purchase at Oregon Liquor Store. These are all before his probation is up, where he's ordered that he's not to consume any type of intoxicant, none whatsoever. So this just goes to the credibility of Mr. Richer and what do we believe, what don't we believe? And when we're talking about the safety of a now 14-year-old child, his daughter, who he hasn't seen for 50% of her lifetime at this point, and whether or not to grant his request, I think it's telling that, again, he's not being truthful with the court. He's not being truthful with the professionals that are engaging in these underlying investigations to make recommendations on treatment in order to ensure that this child is going to be safe. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I'm sorry, Mr. Richer continues to display uh, poor impulse control. So here we are, we're three years or at the time last in June of 2022, so last year, we were two years removed from his uh, displacement or his uh, removal from or completion, pardon me, completion of probation. And yet at our hearing on June 28th of 22, he was so dissatisfied with the court's ruling that he lashed out verbally to my client. And we asked the court to place that lash out 
uh, in the court record, which we've provided as the attachment from the clerk's notes as to his uh, verbal display, uh, whether or not that was uh, related to me uh, on behalf of my client or to my client, it clearly shows that he still is not emotionally healthy. Uh, he holds a lot of disdain for my client and he simply wants what he wants. But again, that does not set forth an appropriate platform for success as far as the reunification at this juncture. Uh, we are asking that the court uh, take into consideration Commissioner Cotterell's ruling from June of 2022 uh, as it relates to the additional findings of abandonment. Uh, the courthouse doors have not been closed to him. The counseling doors have not been closed to him. We are now seven years removed from when he last had contact with his child, and he's now asking for reunification. Commissioner Cotterell considered that to be abandonment. Those findings have not been appealed nor revised. And uh, it's our position that he currently has not complied with the basic requirements from the temporary parenting plan entered five years ago. Uh, we believe that this smacks, quite frankly, of bad faith and that the court should uh, take that into consideration uh, when determining uh, an amount of attorney's fees. Uh, in addition, um, the court order from June specifically says that a, a guardian ad litem, because of that abandonment, needs to be appointed to do an investigation before reunification takes place to determine whether or not reunification should take place. Again, uh, Ms. Dow suggests, well, uh, reunification starts with the child only and that um, there isn't going to be immediate exposure to the parent, but reunification is where everybody gets uncomfortable. And typically in the reunification cases that I've had, the child has to establish a therapeutic relationship with their own counselor so that they have an individual that they can go back to and decompress with from the reunification counseling because the reunification counselor is exactly that. They're tasked with reunifying the parent and the child. They're not tasked with determining whether or not it's in the child's best interest to start that process. The court has already uh, granted that um, authority for the reunification counselor to commence. And so that's why, based on my client's argument last year, the Commissioner Cotterell agreed that before anything happens with Twyla having to establish a therapeutic relationship with a counselor of her own, under the anticipation and expectation that she's going to have to participate in reunification counseling with her father, that a guardian ad litem needs to be appointed to make sure that this is going to be in the child's best interest. So if anything, uh, if the court finds one, that Mr. Richer has in fact complied with the plain language requirements of that prior temporary parenting plan, and that he has in fact completed parental risk evaluation, then we're asking that the court appoint a guardian ad litem on behalf of Twyla to determine if this is in her best interest and that that should be at Mr. Richer's expense. My client also points out the concern that previously there was a guardian ad litem involved in this case. Mr. Richard chose not to be involved in that process. And Mr. Richard currently owes the former guardian ad litem, Ms. Eastwood, $470.84 from the judgment for his unpaid portion of her GAL fees plus accrued interest. So he's not here in good faith uh, based on that. He's also not here in good faith based on the fact that he owes my client prior judgments as well as a $1,500 judgment from last year's hearing. And he's made absolutely no efforts towards payment of those judgments. As we sit here today, he currently owes my client $3,645.07 uh, in judgments. And certainly that goes to show that he's not here in good faith because again, he holds extreme contempt uh, towards my client, which is another factor uh, towards concerns relative to reunification. So we do not believe that we're here in good faith. We do not believe that this is right because he has not completed what he has done. We're asking the court to award my client $2,500 in attorney's fees. We're also asking for payment arrangements and that the court order payment arrangements also on those prior GAL fees because it's clear that he's not gonna do it of his own accord, even though the bank statements that you do have before you show that he has substantial discretionary spending where he could be making payments towards those judgments that are owed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Ms. Dell? Um, Your Honor, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, I'll address the last thing first. Uh, as far as those judgments are concerned, um, I have looked into those and I've discussed them with my client. One of those judgments is actually against uh, the attorney who was at the time. Um, my client is not denying that those judgments were made or that he owes money and we can set up some sort of payment arrangement. That's He's not denying that he needs to pay that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that has to do with coming before the court in good faith, asking for uh, reunification services for him and his child. Um, my client, if, 
Your Honor, you've read the orders. You see what the language says. Um, my client has followed the court's orders. Um, if Dr. Johnson did not include any information about referencing uh, the court record from Washington or the court record from Oregon, that was a call that Dr. Johnson made for his report. I can't speak to that. All I can speak to is that uh, he was offered uh, any pleadings, copies of things that he felt might be necessary and that I would send them to him. Um, I did inform him, as did my client, that there was a lot of material there and that we would supply anything that needed to be supplied. Uh, my client has followed the court's orders. Um, that order about parental risk assessment, if you look at the way it was actually written, and as Ms. McLean read it, it does not clearly state that that should be a separate requirement. Um, some of the standard testing in a parental risk assessment, a, a parenting assessment, if you will, would have been impossible to get because my client had had no contact with the child. How could you assess his parenting style when he'd had no contact? Um, some of that would not have been possible. Uh, so again, my client has complied with everything in the orders. He's done what the judges said. I would say that the only thing that he may not have done that the judge told him to do was make those payments. And we're willing to comply with whatever the court has to say today about making those judgment payments. Um, again, um, as far as the uh, reunification process is concerned, there would be some time before there would be any meeting between parent and child. Uh, my client, as I said, he's not pushing this. He's willing to go at whatever pace the therapeutic professionals suggest. Uh, none of the three of us are psychologists or therapeutic professionals. Um, I would say that it would be up to that professional as to how this should proceed. Um, if the court feels that appointing a guardian ad litem is uh, uh, required here, fine, my client is willing to comply with that as well. It will extend the amount of time this is going to take because he's going to have to put together the money for that. Um, but he's willing to comply with whatever the court orders. Um, as far as he has understood the court's orders, he's complied with them. Um, as far as the use of alcohol is concerned, again, uh, if you... If, it's publicly available. The places that he went to are pubs. He eats there. They're close by where he lives and where he socializes. Uh, whether or not he was actually drinking alcohol there, we don't know. Um, for whatever reason, he went into an Oregon liquor store while he was on probation. We don't know that either. Um, he has family in the area. Uh, not sure what was going on there. Um, but if you take a look at the extensive material for the last what, for seven years, and all of his contacts with mental health professionals, all of whom are uh, very experienced, uh, the ones in Oregon are very experienced with uh, criminal offenders. Um, I think it's pretty clear that this was a one-off situation. My client is not glossing over what he did. He's saying, very frankly, he doesn't know exactly why he did what he did. Um, so he's taking responsibility for it. He admitted it. Um, he admitted it before he was ever charged. Um, he's never denied that he did it. Um, so he is taking responsibility. That is a mischaracterization to say that he's not. Um, and he's not minimizing the seriousness of what happened. That's uh, it, that's clear in, in all of the conversations that have been recorded with the third parties, professional third parties who have been involved with him. Um, as far as the incident was concerned, <laughs> On the record, last time we were here, uh, my client did make an extremely rude remark, and it was about his ex-wife. Um, these are the kind of things that people do when they are frustrated, and they uh, he didn't realize that his mic was still on. That was not directed towards the court. It was not directed towards Ms. McLean. He intended no disrespect for the court. Um, he was upset. He was frustrated. He has been trying to take care of this for quite a long time. So. Uh, we're asking that the court look at the record, look at the information that we've submitted and allow my client to go ahead and do whatever the court decides is going to be necessary to reestablish his relationship with his child. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Well, at the outset, you know, the the underlying conviction, which I think is a some type of misdemeanor in, in Oregon is is obviously very concerning. Um, the, 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 the young victim there, I think she was 12 or she was 14 and uh, Twyla here is, is 14 also. Um, so, you know, at the outset, that's, that's, a, that's a, that's a big deal. And, you know, there may be reasons why he did what he did. There may be alcohol, drugs, the mixing of both. Um, uh, and then, uh, what's, what's interesting is that since that time, you know, that very concerning, very concerning event occurred 
that there are, there are signs that there's been a, an amelioration of, of the risk. You know, he's he completed two years of sex offender treatment, uh, no new offenses. He completed that in 2021. He completed successfully his probationary period in 2021. He uh, underwent a substance use disorder evaluation, and the recommendation there was that the no truck, no treatment was recommended, and that uh, likely, if you if Oregon will uh, ever get around to qualifying or classifying him again, uh, he would be at a level one, which is the lowest, most likely, since there's been no reoffenses. Um, so we have that, and then we have uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, insight uh, based on a variety of uh, measures that he implemented. And what I think is interesting is that, you know, Dr. Johnson with the MMNPI3 test, he indicated that there is no indication of impulse control disorder or any antisocial personality characteristics, which is somewhat, you know, um, offset to a degree by maybe the outburst in court, which is can be a very frustrating place. Dr. Johnson also indicated that there does not appear to be that uh, Mr. Richard is not engaging in distorted thinking around sexual contact with children. Um, he would be in the lower risk, risk group, according to the ABLE assessment for sexual interest. Um, and that, as far as the danger registry, uh, there was really no concerns there. Um, that, that there's no history of sexual victimization. And the static 99R, which is kind of the, the, the gold standard of, of sex offender type uh, scoring, indicates that he had a score of zero, low risk range of reoffending, and that uh, he does not have a serious history of any, or doesn't have a history of serious mental disorder, and he's had a stable job for 10, 10 or so years. And so, obviously, Dr. Johnson couches his language and says, you know, sexual risk uh, does not, he indicates that it does not present as a reason for continuing to restrict contact between the father and his child. And he indicates that there's never an absolute no risk. So, um, so based on his scoring and, 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 and the like, you know, there's clear signs that there, there's risk has been ameliorated and, and addressed. And at the same time, um, there's some concerns raised by, by Ms. Anderson um, in that there's been continued what appears to be use, usage or purchase or consumption of, of alcohol during the probationary period and, and after the probationary period. Certainly, a person can go to a pub and, and simply eat and not drink alcohol. Uh, the Oregon liquor store, uh, there, there are purchases there um, of some sort. And I don't think, I mean, they may sell, sell snacks and stuff there, but the principal commodity being sold is, is, is liquor or, or alcohol. So there's some concerns uh, that are raised there. Um, so obviously, uh, the, the, the breach of the societal contract and maybe a personal contract uh, that led to the conviction, it, it looms large, and, and it should, um, and that Mr. Uh, Richard's activities post-conviction post, um, have been admirable. He's done well. He's made some significant improvements. So the psychosexual evaluation, sometimes we'll see that as in, put in words such as psychosexual evaluation with parental risk assessment component. Sometimes it'll come out as, as, as that. And a lot of times that comes out in the dependency world. So I've seen it both ways. I've seen it that with as a, being a component. Other times I've seen it as a, a simple uh, separate order. So while Dr. Johnson, he did, he did address risk in several different factors. In the MM, MMNPI3, he talked about indication of risk related to impulse control. The danger res, registry addressed risk. Uh, the static 99R addressed risk. Uh, and also the mental disorder evaluation addressed uh, risk. What it doesn't specifically do is address parental risk, um, it's, which is a more fine pointed uh, tool, if you will, uh, or tools that was, was not implemented. And while there may be some confusion with later orders, the initial order did say parental risk assessment period and also psychosexual evaluation period. So while Dr. Johnson uh, did complete the psychosexual evaluation, uh, and did address in part risk, some risk factors. Uh, the parental risk uh, wasn't fully developed, at least in, from the, the instruments that Dr. Johnson used and the information that he uh, produced based on the tools that he did use. So I think there does need to be a specific parental risk assessment. Um, also related to the guardian ad litem. I'm sensitive to that. The argument that Mr. Richer makes is that, look, we've got a reunification counselor, we've got a counselor for the daughter um, and that, that will help support everybody and they can guide the way. The guardian ad litem's uh, principal job is to be the eyes and ears and mouth, if you will, of, of, a, of a minor child and whether that child's best interest would be served. Um, and I, I tend to agree with Ms. Ms. McLean is that when the court makes an order and said, hey, reunification counselor, do your thing, that, that there's no question that that's the direction we're going. There may be some uh, potholes in the, in the way or obstacles, but that's the direction we're taking. Um, I think that it would be appropriate in this case to have a guardian ad, ad litem uh, share the input uh, as to the best interest of the child. 
Um, so I, I will require that the guardian ad litem be appointed. Uh, prior to that guardian ad litem doing any work, Ms. Eastwood's uh, debt needs to be satisfied. There's no sense in uh, asking a court-appointed guardian ad litem to do work if they're not going to be paid for it. So Ms. Eastwood needs to be paid first, and then uh, the new guardian ad litem will need to have a, a deposit of, a, of at least $500 before that guardian ad litem will do work on this case. So as far as attorney fees, um, I'm not going to make a finding of bad faith. Um, I'm not going to deny the request for attorney fees. And I think those addresses the issue. So just in summary, that the there needs to be a separate parental risk assessment. Uh, Ms. Eastwood's debt needs to be satisfied and there needs to be a deposit of at least $500 to the new guardian ad litem. The new guardian ad litem's job is going to be related solely to the reunification counseling and whether that's in the best interest of the child. And that's that, that would be their report. So, so given that, let me ask the parties as far as the guardian ad litem appointment. Um, we could. I, I'm assuming we could possibly do that today if the clerk has the, the list available of the next available folks. And if the parties are in a position to do that now, we could we could take care of that now. Or if you want to pause and consult with your clients, I guess my only concern is if we need the parental risk assessment before we get started with all of this. Typically, we set uh, final reviews four months out, and I don't know that we can get a parental risk assessment completed in that time frame. So I guess my suggestion would be is that we um, receive confirmation that he's completed the parental risk assessment and that he's paid Ms. East, Ms. Eastwood's debt. Um, and then my only other question or clarification would be is, uh, should the parental risk assessment include collateral input from my client? Ms. Dow, do you want to maybe start with that, that last item, collateral input, and then go to the other items? Well, Your Honor, um... If we're going to give any trust and credence to a professional's assessment, then there should not be a problem with collateral input. Um, the only collateral input at this point, really, that uh, Ms. Anderson is going to be able to provide is the fact that uh, these events occurred up to 2016. She's had no further contact with Mr. Richer. Um, she told uh, the GAL, Keith Lawrence, that he had been a good father. Um, so. I'm not sure how much value her collateral input is going to be, but we're certainly not going to object to it. Okay. And then as far as timing of a, a appointment of guardian ad litem, given the length of time that the parental risk assessment may or may not take. Um, Your Honor, if I may, if we're going to require a parental risk assessment, given that um, the interpretation of a sentence with two specific clauses in it uh, has been that there were supposed to be two separate different uh, evaluations. At this point, I would appreciate it if the court would be specific about what that parental risk component should entail, because I don't want to come back and say we missed a test. Hmm. Yeah, at least from my vantage point, a parental risk assessment uh, will address all aspects of potential risk from the, that may flow from a parent to, to a child. I'm not going to get into specific tools or actuarial studies that there were, that I don't know anything really about, um, but I think that parental risk assessment, because like I said, Dr. Johnson touched on several areas of risk uh, that could touch upon a parental parental risk, but I don't think it was fully developed because they weren't they weren't tools specifically related to per parent parental risk. So, um, I, I, I and I think in the future I I don't I don't think I, I will be nitpicky if if the 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 doctor uh, administers whatever battery of tests he or she wishes that address parental risk in a situation where there's been a, a conviction uh, against a, a minor female um, and then with the potential for reunification with a minor female child. So I'm going to back off and, and uh, reserve stating any specific things that need to occur within that. Your Honor, can we allow that whoever does the risk assessment makes reference to the previous evaluations and reports um, don't want to uh, have my client have to pay to repeat testing that's already been done. Sure. I, I th that seems reasonable. Ms. McLean, any concerns about that? Uh, I would leave that up to the professional because that would be um, based on whatever the battery was provided and how each um, counselor, each um, professional interprets the results in relationship to their own interactions with the patient or client. Okay. I, I don't know that they can do that ethically. So I, I would leave that up to them. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, 
Yeah, I think so. I think you know the, the professionals they can they can uh, refer to whatever information that they feel is appropriate. If, if prior testing, if they feel that's a, a good source, then certainly they can consult that. And I also think the collateral input is fine. Also, uh, to the degree to which uh, they give weight to that, given the time frames, I don't know how much they will. They may put a lot. May, may put very little. Um, so. Thank you for that input. I appreciate that. So I think what we'll do, we'll get the parental risk assessment completed and then Ms. Uh, Ms. Eastwood paid. And then once those have been completed, we'll get it noted up and then we can appoint the GAL and get the GAL off and running. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, presentation. So uh, let's see. So just getting back uh, refocused here uh, related to the email that we were that was sent to me. Let me just pull that up because I haven't looked at it since. And Your Honor, my legal assistant sent you one with just the RFAs in it because the other one had other documents it had the declaration and things like that okay yeah i'm looking at that latter one now um so i see uh first request for admissions to petitioner it looks like it's a five-page document and there are answers uh, included in each of those and then i remember earlier ms winkles you had mentioned specific numbers where you felt that it was uh inadequate i think at some of the answers yes your honor um number two rfa number two uh, admit that you received 59000 in payment from the, for the food truck, and the answer there, please refer to questions answered in second set of interrogatories for an accounting of truck proceeds. Okay, and then the other, other concerns? RFA number four. Admit that you cashed out a portion of your community retirement for the benefit of your own legal fees. Unfortunately, you and the respondent continue to drag this on with further false accusation and legal fees continue to accrue. Okay. RFA 13. 13 reads, admit that you informed your son that you purchased a new puppy after the date of separation objection this question violates respondents freedom to live his life and communicate a new pet during authorized visitations okay rfa 14 which reads admit that you have called both children names uh, the pg 13 rated names i called the children don't compare the obscenities the respondent has called the petition in front of the children okay rfa 15 admit that you have an average yearly un income of seventy five thousand dollars. that is incorrect Okay. RFA 17. Admit that you spent time in the hospital due to drug intoxication. No, this is another lie per per perpetuated by the respondent. And that one I'm on the fence about. It appears to be a denial. Um, RFA 20. 20 reads, admit that Jesse Gall did not inform the police of the situation due to your immigration status. What immigration status, question mark? This is another one of the respondent's racist remarks. I have been a legal resident for over 25 years and contrary to the respondent's delusions, something marriage to me has no bearing on my legal status. Okay. All right. So those are the, those, those are the concerns. So t tell me again, Ms. Ms. Winkles. So it looks like on 17, uh, number 17, that looks like that's a, a denial saying no, just dis disagree on that. I think I think it is. That was the one I was on the fence about because obviously um, CR 36 says the answer shall specifically deny the matter. The denial shall fairly meet the substance of the requested admission. That one was on I was on the fence about. The other ones don't. They essentially are making statements that have nothing to do with the question. Um, the what first one what about um, 15, where it says oh. admit that you have an average yearly income of $75,000. That is incorrect. In other words, no. OK, um, I think it, that's, that's a fair interpretation of that. OK. Um, and then 14, 14 um, you know, PG-13 isn't what PG-13 used to be. You know, PG-13, F-bombs are flying all the time. There's there's a, there's, there's really no holds on PG-13 movies anymore. So uh, so is that an admit? You see, that's the question. Yeah, it's, it's not clear. It's not clear. So that one's a little unclear. And so then 13, um, as far as uh, about the puppy. Um, It kind of sounds like that's a yes at admission. Mr. Gall, what do you think about that on 13? Is, is, is that an admission that you informed your son that you purchased a new puppy after the date of separation, notwithstanding freedom of speech concerns and be able to communicate with your child? You know, Your Honor, I'm not denying that I got a new puppy after my kids asked that the puppy, that the dog that stayed with me, be returned to them. But I just don't follow the line of questioning. It seems very intrusive. Um, and, you know, based on my recent communication with the uh, attorney today, I'm starting to see a pattern that really raises some concerns. I'm not denying it, Your Honor. I am admitting it, but I am asking, you know, to what extent are they going to uh, attempt to persuade the court in painting me in a different picture that I'm not? What's wrong with me obtaining a puppy? Okay. So so it looks like on, on 13, um, 
that the new. So basically, it sounds like there's a you're, it's an admission. You're admitting to that, um, and then on four, number four, that's the one talking about admit that you cashed out a portion of the community of the community retirement for benefit of your own legal fees. Um, kind of, and then Mr. Gall's indication was like this thing's being dragged out and it's costing me a lot of money. So is that an, an admission or, or not an admission? Well, so that was a very tough answer. And, you know, since we took a break, uh, the attorney and I have had a chance to reestablish dialogue, and that takes a little longer. Should I answer here or should I answer in writing, Your Honor? I would prefer here, Your Honor. I'm happy to do so, of course. Um, during during the sale of the food truck proceeds, I had attempted to return money back to the kid um, education account. Um, apparently, that uh, didn't take place because the previous attorney was non-responsive to me. And that time, the respondent had uh, taken the freedom to continue to accuse me of obscenities with my children. I sought help to protect myself, which required medical and legal fees. So I did have to use some of the uh, funds that were uh, earmarked for the kids' educational account for that, uh, which came out of the truck proceeds. This was discussed last time, Your Honor, and um, not the community savings accounts. The community savings accounts, they, you know, they were cashed out for me to get by. Uh, but not for anything else. Um, there are some funds in there, but I mean, we're not even there yet. The respondent has not even provided me a first set of interrogatories. And when I asked, why I met with this um, just pushback. I, but, uh, I yeah. provided those in 2022. Just in the course it's, of Let's just stay focused on number four. So number four, yeah. admit that you cashed out a portion of the community retirement for benefit of legal fees. Is, is that a kind of just narrowing down it wasn't it wasn't community retirement your honor it was educational accounts okay so that's a denial yeah okay and then number two is the admit that you received fifty nine thousand dollars in payment for the food truck please refer to the earlier answers in second set of interrogatories uh, for the accounting of the truck proceeds so ms winkles as far as that the, did you check on the second set of interrogatories his response I, to that? I did and it's incredibly confusing it doesn't state all i want to know is if mr gall received fifty nine thousand dollars in exchange for the food truck it, it's a pretty simple question the answer in the second set so the, it went on it never gave a finger okay mr gall yes uh your honor um so the answer to that specific question is a denial um the figure is incorrect okay all right. So let me just, I appreciate the collaboration. Thank you for forwarding, both of you forwarding the, the answers to me. Um, the, I guess the, if my notes are accurate, the only one that we had a question about still, Ms. Winkles is 14. 14. Did, and then did we get 20? I didn't hear 20. Let's go to 20. Sorry. Admit that Jesse Gall did not inform the police of the situation due to your immigration status. No. Um, go ahead. Yes. I just, I, I guess the immigration status one wasn't clear either. Um, it's just a or deny. I guess Mr. Gall indicates that he says I have been a legal resident for over 25 years. Just gonna check in with the party that Mr. Jay, so I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Gall, is that a, a, a denial that correct. Jesse Gall did not inform the police of the situation due to your immigration status? Okay. That is correct, Your Honor. Um, unfortunately, my ex-wife suffers from mental delusions of such matters. Okay. Mr. Binet, I'll check in with you. All right, and then 14, uh, as far as calling children's names, um, is um, that... A, den a denial or an admission, whatever the names those, those were, whether they were G, yeah. PG. Yeah. yeah, if I may get a little graphic, Your Honor. Yeah, I did call them, you know, you know, less less offensive words, no F words or F bombs or anything to that sort. And in a few moments of anger, so I'm not I'm not denying that. It's just it's very uh, focused, and um, you know, but that's that's okay. I I did in a moment of anger uh, blur out a, a bad name to my children. No F bombs to that effect, though. Okay. All right. So that sounds like that's a, an admit with a little explanation. Yeah. Okay. So I appreciate this, Ron. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad we can kind of sort things out a little bit. So Ms. Winkles, as far as like uh, your, the information that you've received today from Mr. Gall, do, do you, are you, does your motion entail any additional requests? Yes, Your Honor. I asked for attorney fees again. Um, I've, my client makes essentially a little over minimum wage. I I sent these out seven months ago. I filed this action May 22nd. I only received these answers um, on July 7th at 4.46 p.m. In the last hearing, um, Mr. Hall said he'd have an attorney and he was talking to somebody, he'd get them to us. Um, we literally got them 14 minutes before closing on Friday. Um, it's now Tuesday. Um, I've had to be here a number of times. I continued it because I just wanted the answers. You know, had he just mailed this out seven months ago, 
um, there or six months ago when they were originally due, there would be no issue. Had he mailed them out May 22nd, I could have struck this whole thing. I've been here twice on this docket at a significant cost to my client. And I'd ask for attorney fees and in, um, in the sum of $1,500 or whatever your honor deems appropriate. The initial the initial filing, you said it was in January? Or the January 11th. It was seven months to the day when we served Mr. Gold's attorney. Okay. Thanks. Your Honor, may I respond? Please. So, Your Honor, um, as you can tell by the last declaration I submitted to the court, I attempted to uh, provide these answers in a timely manner. Not exactly sure why my attorney did not uh, reciprocate with an elaboration or, a, you know, a discussion of those or why they were not turned in. So here I am trying to catch up with all of this attorney's efforts to try to, um, you know, bombard new attorneys with information in an effort to drown them and have them fail in, my, in their representation of me. Um, and additionally, Your Honor, I find this request very hypocritical since I have in writing from this attorney that she will not be charging her client today as she's on the docket for other matters. Um, you're, you're you know, right, it is, I'm sorry, I was speaking, if I may. But um, so, you know, I, I, I find myself very, very uh, disturbed trying to figure out an, am an amicable way, amicable way into in which we can discuss and get these answers. But instead, um, in which I can provide all of this information to the court, I just, you know, I, I met with petty resistance from this attorney via email uh, in my request to try to move things forward. Um, I am not denying the fact that this is a timely uh, process for everyone, but I certainly do welcome the possibility of email agreements as the court has requested in the past. And finally, if I may remind the court, this hearing today was set for a presentation for which um, a, an agreement has already been signed. So um, if the court would please consider my efforts and my lack of income, and I'm just at my financial wit's end to this, I really would like to bring some matters to the court that will exemplify how this one-sided attack is not being seen by the court uh, and by which I've let go other matters in which the uh, the respondent has been in contempt of court with matters of health insurance, car insurance, and so on and so forth. So please, uh, if the court would consider uh, waiving those attorney fees, um, that would be very beneficial in, in attempting for me to get back together with my life and my children. Thank you. Ms. Winkles, just brief reply. Yes, Your Honor. Um, when I emailed Mr. Call, I said it wasn't charging my client for the massive bombardment of emails today um, because clearly she doesn't have the money. And I was already on a different court hearing, which I was charging for. Um, I, I'm charging for the anytime I talk, that's what in court, that's when I charge. Um, the fact is, is that um, the discovery he's talking about was sent to Mr. Anagnostu back in um, my answers back in uh, 2022, July 18th, it was 860 pages. What I told Mr. Gall was I couldn't email it because it was too large and my servers wouldn't allow it to go through. And that I could not, in all good faith, charge his, um, his uh, missus in this case, uh, $86 plus $50 for the legal assistant to do that um, because she'd already been charged for it one time. Um, I said I didn't know if uh, I was even able to charge Mr. Gall that and that we should bring it to your honor um, because I've never charged an adverse party for, for any documents. Um, that is what I said to Mr. Gall. Um, I'm happy to give him that. I'm not trying to hide it. I already served it on Mr. Anagnostu back in 2022. He's welcome to pick it up. Um, I can put it on a flash drive. Um, normally, I would charge for that, but just to be done with it, I, I don't mind doing that. Um, I just don't want to charge my client anymore, frankly. She, she just doesn't have the funds for it. Um, regarding the insurance and all those things, we were already here on June 13th and he made the same comments that he was going to present all this evidence to the court and he's going to show them what, what's really going on. And here we are, July 11th, nothing's been put forward to the court. Um, I'm not sure what to do at this point other than just try to set, we've set it for trial. I'm just trying to move forward, get all the discovery done um, and, and move forward and, and have this be ended so that we're not here forevermore. Um, the fact is Mr. Gall makes a lot of money, makes 75,000. My client makes barely over minimum wage. Um, she lives in a house uh, rented out at a discount rate because uh, I believe one of her family members has it. Um, neither child sees Mr. Gall um, due to Charlotte Rosen's recommendations. Um, my client fled a domestic violence situation. He lives in the marital house. Um, my client has received no spousal maintenance, uh, minimal child support. And frankly, she can't afford what's being asked of her. He took $30,000 out of a community fund and spent it on legal fees. My client didn't do that. Um, we have an order to Mr. Aaron Roster. We're waiting on um, the amount the court's allowed for that. We haven't received it. Um, I've discounted my bill as much as humanly possible for the size of the case that this is. But frankly, she just doesn't have the money. And unfortunately, I'm a solo practitioner. I can't just make it free, even though I'd love to do that. Um, so I'd ask for $1,500. He can continue to make payments. I'm okay with that. He has made a, a good faith payment to me recently. Um, 
but frankly, she just, or we can take it out of the community funds at the end of the trial, um, but she just doesn't have the, the funds to keep coming back. This is no fault of hers. If Mr. Gold tried to fix it with his attorney, his his issue is with that attorney, and he should take it up with that attorney rather than having my client pay for something that should have happened and didn't happen. Okay, thanks. So the, the issue we're talking about is, is the request for attorney fees. So it looks like the the requests were sent in, in on January 11th. Um, it looks like Mr. Um, Gall responded to his attorney, then attorney at the time, Ms. Margraf, on February 20th with her responses. I see Ms. Mar Margraf uh, withdrew on or about first week of April. Thereafter, the, the motion was brought on May 22nd. And thereafter, we had a hearing on that motion on, on June 13th, and then the responses were given on July 7th. Um, there's a little bit of fine tuning here today based on those answers, and um, not uncommon, uh, given that Mr. Gall's not 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 uh, a lawyer. Uh, so the amount of time that's uh, flowed from January till now is about six months. Um, Mr. Gall responded in about five weeks to his attorney after he was initially served. And then it was about five weeks from the hearing until he submitted his response on the, the 7th. So, you know, there's there's some delays there. Um, I, I can understand that you know, somebody who's supplied information to an attorney would make a, have a solid understanding that that attorney is going to do what they need to do with that and supply it to the other attorney. Then that was brought to um, his attention on May 22nd on or about when the motion was filed. And then thereafter, about two weeks or three weeks transpired until they, we actually had the hearing. And then I'm making an assumption that Mr. Call probably talked to maybe a legal legal counsel or, or others related to how to kind of respond and got it in on the 7th. Um, so I, I think there's a fairly good effort on both parties' parts, uh, but it took some effort to get us here. Um, and that effort generally t means time and money uh, for both. So I'm going to impose $350 of attorney fees, less than the requested $1,500. And I think with the presentation, um, it's not going to be a lengthy order by any means, uh, but we could look at one or two weeks, either the 18th or 25th, if the parties come to an agreement of what the court ordered here today. Basically, it's attorney fees, um, and that Mr. Gall has supplied answers to the CR uh, to the admissions requests. Um, I am available the 25th, Your Honor. Yeah, the 25th works for me. My son has um, a camp in Portland that I have to drive to next week, so that'd be great. 25th of July at 9 a.m. If the parties agree. Uh, simply make sure that signed order gets to me by both parties and then I can sign off on it and then we can just uh, strike the hearing. Mr. Gall, question? Yes, yes, Your Honor. The agreement had previously been signed, but having noticed some of the um, the uh, respondents' attorney's tactics, there's some verbiage on the request for the money to be removed. The court never uh, specified that I needed to initiate the request to my previous attorney. And so I was wondering if uh, the petitioner's attorney could make the request directly once the order has been um, has been confirmed. I'm confused, Your Honor, what, what's being requested. Yeah, could, could you could you explain that to me again? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so it was my impression that today was going to be the presentation and that um, the facts that, that I had previously signed two weeks ago were going to be submitted and finalized. It is. Um, but in doing so, I saw a note on, it said that the, the attorney, I'm sorry, the petitioner's attorney added that I needed to be the one to make the request to transfer trust accounts. And that was not specified by the court. And I was wondering if that could just be edited out since we have presentation in two weeks that Ms. Winkles can make that request herself to Mr. Anagnosti once the court has approved that. So I guess I guess my question then, Mr. Gong, because I'm looking at the June 26th order, which related to the uh, passports and also the uh, trust account monies. It mm -hmm. looks like it was signed by Ms. Winkles and it was signed by Mr. Gall. That's so correct. That, what that tells me when it, uh, both parties sign off on it, both parties are comfortable with the language that's been uh, signed off on. And so when I see that, I just look at, make sure it looks like that's what I ordered and I sign off on it. So to go back to change that, uh, I think would require a specific motion because I, I, I kind of take people at their word that if they signed off on it, that they said it's fine. And now you're telling me that it's not fine. You want to change it. So if you want to change it, then you'd have to file a motion to, to amend that order. Okay. Okay, Your Honor. Um, I appreciate that educational uh, step, and um, it's not something that I just changed my mind on. It's, it's a pattern that I recognize today. So I appreciate that, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. And, and you know, the, the issue is, you know, the, the that's, you know, it says indicates here, it says the, where is it? I can write the letter, um, I think, if Your Honor doesn't have a problem with that and just hand it to Mr. Dolph, he doesn't want to have contact with Mr. Anagnostia. It's just because it's a trust account. It's technically in his name, so it has to be. I can give the court order, but also that's his client and the trust is in his name. So I thought, kill two birds with one stone, get a court order and a letter saying, please transfer this. Got it. I appreciate that, Aaron. Thank you so much. And um, it's just I'm trying to avoid legal fees. That's all. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, I think I, I think the order, you know, number four, it, it indicates Mr. Anagnosti shall at the behest of Mr. Gall transfer the entire trust amount to Ms. Winkle's trust account. So generally, uh, you know, if Ms. Winkles were to say, Mr. Anagnosti, you need to do this, Mr. Anagnosti may say, mm, I need to hear from my client or former client. And so if there's a letter that's signed by Mr. Gall that's prepared by Ms. Winkles, that'll uh, hopefully that'll, that'll do the trick and get the monies over. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. That'll conclude our hearing for today.